Hello, I'm not sure if everyone can hear me. Uh, let me just adjust my screen a bit so that I can see everyone in the chat. Okay, can everyone hear me? Perfect, you can hear me. Excellent, just give me a second and I'm going to get my, to get Amanda on here. Amanda, where are you? <laughs> How is everyone doing on this crazy Wednesday? I feel a little warm, which is odd. No sound, good now, okay, good, good now. <laughs> Hi, Judy. Hi, Amanda. I see a lot of people. Hi, Kristen. Where are you all from? Just going to wait for Amanda to log on. I'm just going to message. Ah, oh, here she is. Amanda's from Brampton. Olga's from Toronto. Kristen, you're from Scarborough. Welcome. Judy, you're from Mississauga. Hi, Judy. Hi, Amanda. Hey, sorry. My, I went to go into Zoom, and it was like, no, we don't know your speakers are there. I'm like, what? What? I'm about to start. <laughs> I'm just saying hi to everyone, seeing where everyone's from. Um, Don Mills and Shepard, hi, all. Ecuador and Ottawa, ooh, that's pretty good. Ecuador is a place I've always wanted to go to. Hi, Mama. Quite a few people logging in. So it is Wednesday, everyone. It is, I don't know about you, but I feel like it's been such a long week already, but I'm so excited that it's actually a short week because there has been so much going on in the world of Canadian small business women over the past two weeks. Some of you might know, some of you might not, but we had a crap ton of website issues and Amanda has saved the day <laughs> and is still continuing to save the day. Yeah. Uh, no, you really did because I was really, really stressed out and um, our website kept going down and now Amanda is making everything work. I just need to get all my blogs back, which I'm going to sit down and post, repost everything on Saturday because I just want them all there. And in the midst of that, we have an event coming up in less than a month and there's a lot of work still left to be done for that so if you're in the Niagara area or if you would like to drive out to Niagara for the day make sure you come and visit us at our small business seminar on the 15th of May and uh, if you have friends out there tell them about the event because it will be great we're gonna have some government agencies come in and speak about how they can help you with your business so that part I think is something that a lot of people always want to know how you know they can get a little help from the government or what government services are out there to help them with their business. Um, aside from that, what else has been new this week? I don't know because my memory is, <laughs> it's really how it is. I feel a little overwhelmed with everything that's going on. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't want to sit and blab for the whole time. I would, hi Rosa. <laughs> I would, um, I definitely want to turn the floor over to Amanda. I've known Amanda for how long now? Uh, at least a couple of years. We've done at least a couple expos together. About four years or so, I think. I think two or three. Yeah, it's more than two. <laughs> definitely more than two. <laughs> so yeah. Um, Amanda has been nothing less than a blessing in my life. I can tell you that much because she is very knowledgeable. She is very skilled and she is going to talk to us about newsletters. And, you know, when she talks to us about newsletters, I'll tell you a little surprise that I have coming up for my newsletter. So enough of me. I'm going to hand it over to Amanda and then I will start driving her um, deck while she speaks. If you have any questions, feel free to ask it um, in the chat or in the Q&A tab. I will monitor that. And I have pen and I have book and I am ready to take notes because 
I need to up my newsletter game because it's really not good. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to share my screen now. Amanda, the floor is yours. Okay. So I'm going to try to make this really fun, even though we have to cover some pretty boring stuff at the beginning. And there is a chance that if there's, if we really want to get into the topic more that we could do a second webinar. Yes, there is. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that we could say about doing newsletters. So, um, I'm not going to watch the chat. Duenia will watch that for questions and hopefully we'll have time at the end to do questions. And I'm just going to get back to my list here. I have my whole thing planned out in a sauna so I can follow along. Now, I'm going to do a very brief introduction to myself. Um, just so that you know that, you know, I know what I'm talking about, that I've got lots of experience in, in all this kind of stuff. And that would be the next slide, Duania. There we go. So I actually have been working with customers. I started as a virtual assistant over 10 years ago. Um, yeah, definitely over 10 years. So it's been quite a while. <laughs> Um, and I started, I actually found that a lot of my clients needed websites and I actually started building into that more. So I've been working with custom clients, starting with authors. My first ones were all authors. It was not by choice. It just so happened to be. Um, and so I, it, it just started building slowly until it became a more successful business as most businesses do. I've worked with a number of different industries and I still do from authors, pet services, business services, coaches, e-commerce, artists, you name it. It's in there. Um, home improvement, construction kind of stuff. Totally got it. Uh, and I actually started building web, web, uh, websites before WordPress existed. So if you don't know what WordPress is, go look it up. It's really helpful for your website if you have a good host. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I actually started building websites before WordPress existed. I often get the you don't look old enough for all that, but I am. So. <laughs> Um, and yeah, so I started this business more as a general virtual assistant. I spent many years researching um, and learning how to conduct business online and the tools there were to use and what was the right way to do things. Uh, and the one thing you fall into, the trap that we all fall into, is you take on clients and you stop doing it for yourself. You just make everyone else successful. So <laughs> you have to pull back sometimes and find another way to do it. And it's just a little fun fact is I actually have had my own business since I was nine years old. So I'm definitely not new to the world of entrepreneurship. It's a kind of, I was just born that way. And now let's move on to more interesting stuff. Um, so really today's, I mean, it's happened a lot lately. Facebook's been down a few times. Messenger's been down. WhatsApp's been down. What do you do to reach your audience if they're all on social media and there's no social media? You're kind of uh, in a bit of trouble. So... This is where we want to talk more about newsletters. Right. So if you had an email newsletter list that was separate from social media, you would still be able to contact everybody. I actually am curious, people who are here now, if who actually has a separate email list already? I know a lot of entrepreneurs don't start this. So three people raised their hand thus far, four, which is great. Okay, that's good. Yeah, so we got a Good few. Start. That's really good because I know a lot of them are like, I don't need an email list. I don't know what I would email. What would I, you know, and then something like Facebook goes down and they're like, but all of my people were there or their page gets banned or, you know, things like that happen. And they're like, but now I've got nothing. You're like, well, this is the answer. And so then, of course, they have to start, once that's happened, to then build an email list. So anyone here now who doesn't have an email list, this is your warning, because it can happen to you. So now we're going to talk about more the rules first. I, a lot of people want to dive right in, and I get that. Next slide. Um, so the first thing you think is, do I just ask people for their email addresses and send them the newsletter? That's it. It's simple, right? And I would love to say yes. I would love to say yes, because we all want things to be simple. But the reality is, thanks to CanSpam and Castle, which actually is good for all of us, 
you can get fined up to over $42,000 if you do not follow the rules when email marketing. That's why we're going to cover some pretty boring stuff at the beginning because I don't want you to get fined. I don't want you to get in trouble and I want you to have a healthy business that has a good growing audience and not lose that audience. So can spam is actually controlling the assault of non-solicited pornography and marketing act of 2003. This is also in the U S I know when you think of can spam, you might think Canadian spam because it's just can spam, but it's a lot wider than that. And Castle is actually more the, um, the strong arm. They're the ones that would be giving you the fines. So both have separate rules, but we have to follow them to make sure that we're not going to get those fines. So just briefly, the can spam rules. And we'll ha I'll have some examples of this stuff so that you can understand it more. Don't use false or misleading header information. And that is when you see a subject line, if it's manipulative, if it's just to draw you in, it's actually considered spam. And you've seen that with, with posts on Facebook that have a misleading title. And then you read it and you're like, that wasn't even about that. I don't get it. It's clickbait. If you have clickbait headlines for your newsletter, it's considered spam. Even if the rest of the content's good, it's still required. So don't use any of the deceptive subject lines. Make sure that it's clear who it's from. You or your brand, the person who's signing up for you or your brand, if you are your brand, still use you. If you are having an advertisement in there or a joint partnership, something you're getting paid for, you must identify it as an ad. You must also include your address. There are ways around this. I personally live in an apartment, so I just don't put in my apartment number, especially for those of us that work at home. PO boxes, I believe, don't count, but I can look that up for those that might ask that question. Well, what I do for mine is I have everything go through a UPS store, so it doesn't exactly look like a, P a PO box, so I use that as an address. Yeah, and there are um, like offices now that you can actually just pay a little bit to have your mail go to those offices every month instead of to your home. So for those that live at home, those are options, but you do have to include some kind of address for your business in your newsletters con newsletter correspondence. Um, they must also be able to unsubscribe from your newsletters. That is required. It's not that they have to, if you, some people will start with, oh, email me if you want to unsubscribe. That's not, that's not the requirement. They have to easily be able to click an unsubscribe option. Um, and it must be clear, it can't be hidden. Honor all those opt-out requests as well. Even if you're like, but that was my best friend. If they opted out, they opted out. Sorry. Um, and if you are using somebody else to do your newsletters, you must monitor what they're doing. If they are doing something on your behalf and they do it wrong, the fine comes back to you, not them. Next one. Castle rules, a little bit different. And I'm gonna keep saying it castle instead of C-A-S-L because it just sounds nicer. We're trying to make it more interesting. It requires businesses and organizations to abstain, obtain consent before sending. Now we know there's two different kinds, expressed and implied. Your safest bet is to always ask permission. Don't just assume that when someone hands you a business card that they are aware they're gonna start getting your newsletter. Have them opt in. Now there's some that are not specific to this, um, but there are just securing your business's computers, devices, and networks to prevent spam. That's more so to watch for hackings and malware, which can affect it. Um, but we're not going to get into that. That is totally a whole other topic. Um, and just teaching your, um, anyone working with you how to do it for you. So it's generally about if you have a business and you're hiring people, make sure they're aware of how to work with spam practices because it still comes back on you, the business, first before it comes back on them at all. Okay, so I think that's mostly like the really specific boring stuff. So we're gonna get into some more examples. So how do you use those rules to ensure compliance? So as I was just saying, ask people when you meet them in person at events or meetings if they would like to receive your newsletter instead of just assuming. If you're getting a lot of uns, go back. Sorry. Yeah. 
if you're getting a lot of unsubscribes, that'll look like you're spamming people. That's going to be flagged as there's something wrong here with this account, that they're getting so many unsubscribes, they must be doing something wrong. So make sure that you don't just assume that you're always asking and you're, you have this conversation. Would you like to join my newsletter so that I can keep you up to date on whatever you're talking about? If you have a table at an event, you can say, leave your business card here for my, to join my newsletter. You know, have a sign for it. But never just say, I know Sorry? I do contest at a lot of events where I'm a vendor, but at my ballot, on my ballot sheet, there's always that opt-in check that they would have to check off. Or people, there are people who don't want to fill out the ballot form. They want to just drop their business card, and that's fine. But I write in the contest entry signage that if you drop your business card, assume that you will be added to our mailing list. So they are informed. Yeah, definitely. And that's the best way to do it. So if you want to go to the next slide, use your name or business name as the from information. So I just copied mine in here. I just did a little screenshot um, so that you could see I use MailChimp and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about MailChimp near the end because it's really good for those starting out. Um, plan your content and use subject lines that reflect the content. No phishing, no spam, no bait and switch, nothing sketchy or unclear. Be precise. So this was one that I recently sent out. It was book a free 30 minute call with me. That's exactly what it was about. It was inviting them to book a 30 minute free call with me. There was nothing unexpected. They knew if they opened the email, there was going to be information pertaining to that. My name, it's me who they know they're signing up to. So if you have a brand name, make sure that, to be honest, a lot of people look for a person even behind a brand. There's a lot of bigger name brands now that when they're sending out an email will actually use like a person. So a representative of the company, someone who maybe is in charge of customer care um, or, or just community outreach. So keep that in mind. But if your brand name is well known, you can still use your brand name instead of your name or a contact name. I think that's pretty clear. Um, and so use one way to really be compliant is to use a newsletter client such as MailChimp, Constant Contact, ConvertKit, AWeber. There's a whole bunch of them out there. This is, as I said, I use MailChimp so it shows you that it actually puts my address in there for me. I don't have to do that manually every time. And the reason it's also better to use them is because they will ensure that you're compliant because they would also be held responsible if they allow you to send spam and not stop you if they see red flags. So they're definitely going to make sure that your account and what you're doing is compliant. It's a safe bet. Enable double opt-in for email subscribers from your website or social media. And double opt-in is, is just so, I did a little example down here, but it's really when you get those emails. So you sign up for a newsletter and you get this email that says confirm. And you have to click on that link to be able to confirm your subscription. And the reason for that is because someone else can go somewhere and put in your email address. You may never have opted in, but they've just put you in there. And if you don't confirm that, you're suddenly, this person could get their newsletter flagged because they're suddenly sending you stuff and you mark it as spam, not realizing that somebody else put you in there. So this can cause problems to, the, to email marketers. This is why we require double opt-in and it is required by all of our, like the spam requirements, Castle and can spam. I believe it's required pretty much everywhere that has spam oversight in the world now. So make sure that you're always using that. There's usually a checkoff option. I know in MailChimp, you actually have to choose to have it enabled. Always make sure you look out for that. Okay, now we get into more creative stuff. We're done all that boring rule stuff. Saving you from $42,000 in fines. Okay, so I know it was all boring, but. So this is one of the more often, like biggest questions that you often start with. How often do I send my newsletters? And this actually comes back to knowing your audience first. So for example, if you have, if you're dealing with moms with young children, you might realize they're more likely to check their emails at like eight, nine o'clock at night in the evening when the kids are in bed. If you're knowing your audience doesn't give you a time frame, first you choose how often you're going to send it. 
I would normally say start with once a week. Doing it more than that, like you can do it less than that, but doing it more than that could be seen as an over overindulgence by some people. And if your content isn't interesting enough, they're going to unsubscribe. You have to respect that people are getting a lot of emails today. I'm sure a lot of you, like if you saw my, I get like thousands. I have like 20,000 emails that I never get through because you get too many coming. Some of the email marketers sending sales over and over and over again, and you can't keep up. So if you're going to send a newsletter, make sure you do it consistently, but also make sure that you're sending good information. So once you've decided how often you're going to send it, if you don't have enough content for once a week, maybe do once every two weeks until you start getting the hang of it. Maybe once a month even. However, you don't want to leave it for too long because then people will forget who you are and they're more likely to unsubscribe when you show up in their email box again. So first set out and say, okay, I'm going to do this once a week, then test the day and time. So one week you might send, send it on a Monday at two o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, maybe you didn't get very many open. So maybe next time you'll do it in the evening. So there's a, it, it can take a long time to figure out what the best time to send it at is, but this is part of getting to know your audience. And once you start finding the best times, you're going to get a better success rate with your email newsletters. It's all part of starting out. Everything you do will be about testing. So what do you send in your newsletters? There are so many ideas, but there's one thing that I want to impress on you. And that is that if you're sending information in your newsletter, it should be different than the content you're sending everywhere else. I tend to say that if they're liking you on social media, it's like a soft hello. It's like, I'm kind of watching you spying on you. I kind of want to see what you're doing, but I'm not really ready to shake your hand yet. When they sign up for your newsletter, they're kind of saying, okay, I want to know more of what's going on here. I want to know you a little bit more. I want to feel a little more connected to you. But if you start sending them the same stuff that's on the social media, they're going to wonder why on earth they bothered signing up for your newsletter. So remember to treat your newsletter content as something entirely separate from what you do on social media. You know, you can share new blog posts, you can share upcoming events, but make sure that there's some kind of content in there at some point that is different, such as a special tip, maybe an unlisted video, things like that that are going to make them feel special. And always make sure that you're writing your email in the first person directly as if you're having a conversation. We're not fools. We all know when we're getting a mass email, whether it's the footer that tells us, whether it's, you know, a general link that's for everybody, we know this. But if you're speaking directly to somebody, they actually feel like you're getting to know them, like you're connecting with them directly. So when you're writing your emails, write it to your ideal person. Don't write it to everybody. Don't, hey, everybody, how's it going? Say, hi, Duania, I would love to share this with you today. Okay, there's definitely a different tone and a different connection that you're going to get from sending your emails in that way. So I did write down here just some ideas. You should have automated emails set up so that you don't have to figure out what you're going to write and send the day of or, I mean, there will be ones. So start with an automated welcome campaign. And this is what I like about ones like MailChimp. You can start for free and set up your automated mail uh, welcome series. And then if someone signs up through your website, they automatically get a welcome email. Then you could have another email that's already signed, like lined up there for content that you don't have to monitor. It's there, it's ready to go, and it gets sent out. Then what you have to do is come back when you have some new information, like an event or something to announce, and you do that manually. But if you have an automated welcome series, you don't have to worry about not having anything to send at all. And having to spend a lot of time on email marketing. So this here is just some other ideas that you can do, talk about your events. Um, and just a little bonus tip is you can actually get uh, stock images from somewhere like Pixabay and use Canva to actually make them pretty and add your branding. So I love free tools, especially when you're starting out. I'm full of ideas for free tools. 
So there's just a couple more that you can consider when you're doing this to make it easier for you. Your whole goal in any part of your marketing, not just email marketing, is to connect, build trust, and then convert. When you are connecting with people, back, I'm still on the connecting part. Sorry. <laughs> You're trigger happy. Because <laughs> I want to learn everything. <laughs> so as I've talked about, so connecting will be things like sharing things about yourself. And I have to say some of my favorite emails that I get in my newsletter box, my, my, my newsletter box, yes, that's it, my inbox, are ones where people are sharing a story they've learned from something a little more personal, something that they've experienced for real, that they've gotten some lesson out of, that has changed them, that has guided something, someone who's made a mistake and admitted it. And that to me is connecting. You're showing me that you're human. So use your newsletter in a way to connect with people, not just talking one-on-one, -on -one, but the type of content that you share. Of course, you're gonna have boundaries to what you share and what you don't share that are personal, but use stories that are something real that you've experienced in order to connect with people. By doing this, people are going to feel like they're getting to know you and that's going to build the trust they have for you. Then when you say, well, I learned this lesson and this has taught me this, this, and this, so I've created a program about it. Would you love to join my program? You're like, you know, that was an amazing lesson that you learned. I would love to. I feel like I can really connect with you and trust you. So I want to go the next step with you. And that's where they've gone from instead of just the kind of spying on you to the handshake, then they're jumping into the hug. I don't know where I get these analogies from really. It's off the top of my head, but. <laughs> so connect, build trust, convert in email marketing as well as your marketing anywhere else. Next. Can I just use my Gmail to send the newsletter? No. And the reason is, as I showed you, the other ones make sure that you're compliant. The actual dedicated email marketing clients ensure that you are compliant with can spam and Castle. Gmail is meant for sort of your one-on-one -on -one correspondence. You're back and forth. You can have some group conversations, of course, where you're CCing people and all that, but there is not gonna be an unsubscribe option. You will have to answer, enter, you know, enter your email address or your address manually every time or create a signature. It is not considered compliant. So you are more likely to get yourself into trouble by using something like Gmail, Hotmail, or whatnot to do your email marketing. And you really don't need to when you have a free tool like MailChimp to get started with. So just don't do that. Save yourself from fines, please. I don't want to hear horror stories. So let's all talk a little bit about why I support, why I believe MailChimp is good to start with. And that is because it's free, first of all. Who doesn't love a free tool when you're starting out your business? I started with MailChimp, so I can be very honest. And then when I got to the capacity for um, subscribers, I transferred over to Constant Contact. But MailChimp was fantastic. So it's a great tool. See, and I actually tried other ones like ConvertKit and Aweber, and I actually came back to MailChimp. I now, and it's, it's free up to 2,000 subscribers, and even the upgrade price is pretty cheap. I believe it's $10 oh, after that. That's that. really good. Okay, I didn't know that because I'm paying yeah. uh, quite a well, bit more. <laughs> and if you go to the next slide, there's actually a little more. There's, when I first started with MailChimp, before I tried all the other ones, you didn't have automated marketing, like the automated emails that you could schedule ahead of time for free with MailChimp. Now... You do. Yeah. So for those getting started and you want to create your welcome series email, it is free to do it with MailChimp. Whereas everywhere else you have to pay. Mm. There's, there's no reason not to get started with email marketing. You have a free tool. Free up to 2000 people, easy to use, connects to all major websites, compliant with can spam and castle. And here's the cool part. They also, when they first introduced landing pages, I actually was in the middle of doing a training video and there was, it was pretty lame. Now, I would say to you, if you don't have a website yet, use a MailChimp landing page. 
They have beautiful designs now. And you can use that landing page to start building your email list before you even have a website. That's good. So you have no excuse to not have any kind of presence. <laughs> no, we have websites are too hard. I can't figure it out. There are options. And as I mentioned, the free automated scheduling and other intelligent campaign options, um, which I could totally talk all day just about what MailChimp can do for you, actually. I'm actually working on trainings for it right now. So, um, yeah, so that is why I recommend MailChimp. I don't make anything off recommending it to you. It is free. Um, but if you're getting started, that's my best, op that's the best option for you. And I do want to get to questions because I'm sure that there are definitely questions. So it's actually going at pretty good speed here. We have some time to get into more of it because there's so much more we could talk about. Um, so we'll just leave this slide up. Um, and we can talk I will send everyone this slide as well so that you have the link. And I will copy over, Amanda, I don't know if you have, oh, ah, oops, sorry, sorry guys. I'm gonna copy over this link into the chat. So there are a couple of things, like I, first I want to openly admit my newsletters, they are absolutely terrible. Um, it's partly because I do not like writing at all, but I have recognized that they are terrible. I actually just had a meeting with someone yesterday regarding my newsletters, and there's going to be a bit of a change. So stay tuned, everyone. The month of May, things will look a little different because I will have different styles for different things that's coming out. And there will also be a new newsletter coming out once a month, and there's a name for it. Yes, there's a name for it. We actually went through a whole lot of names and I'm looking it up to tell you what it is because no, I don't know it by heart yet. It's going to be Inside Conversations with Duania. So you'll get to know a little bit more about me and some of my thoughts, but it's hard for me to put things on paper because I prefer to talk, right? And sometimes when I write things, I don't always like to write the way I speak because I'm crazy expressive and sometimes I use some slang here and there and when I'm writing I would prefer to be more professional because I am very much a rule follower type of person so it's hard for me to break out and do something like this so I will be very interested to hear everyone's feedback once they start rolling out because I need it <laughs> and it will probably give me a little bit more confidence to keep writing the way how it will be because I do need that push to continue. So newsletters, I do agree with everything Amanda says. Sometimes you really want to feel like you're getting to know that person. And I don't think I'm closed, but I don't think I'm open enough either. So yeah. <laughs> I do see people talking about other free platforms and there are other free email marketing platforms. I just personally can't vouch to how compliant they are with Castle and Can Spam without having checked them out. So that's just one thing to look for if you try to use another platform. Just check them to make sure that they're following all the rules for you. And um, Constant Contact, I don't believe there's a free version. I did, I am paying quite a bit, but there's so many features that I did not realize I wasn't using until yesterday, I kid you not. So I'm having someone help me with um, laying out some of my newsletters just to make it pretty because again I'm not the person who makes things pretty I all I care about is the content and I didn't realize that I can add other users at different levels and I'm only at the first level of constant contact it might be about 60 or 70 US dollars a month uh, but I have the option of adding users and I also I'm I'm saying this out loud. I'm so embarrassed when I didn't realize this. I didn't realize that I can get a short link for my actual newsletters. Anything I email out, I can have a link and share it to anyone who's not on my list. For example, I can share my newsletter link on social media and someone can click on the link and read it. Except that, remember we <laughs> talked about not sharing the same information from the newsletter on the social right. media. Right, it wouldn't be like the newsletter. It would be like, let's say I have an event post, uh, I don't want to call it a newsletter, an email about events happening in the month of April. I can actually post the link about that, but it wouldn't be my official newsletter. But 
Constant Contact has a lot of features. I did not seek out Constant Contact because I thought it was the greatest or anything. They were a sponsor of one of our events early on. And a part of that sponsorship was a free year. And after the free year, I liked it so much that I just continued to use it. So I can't say I like it over another platform because I really didn't use any other platform aside from MailChimp, which again was great until I hit 2000. I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. And I've, I've tried Constant Contact. Um, I've tried ConvertKit and I've tried AWeber. And I still came back to MailChimp. And I get all my clients started into MailChimp. Hmm. So, um, especially when I found out that they started including the automated marketing, uh, automated mail messages for the free version. I was like, no way! I'm totally back for that! Like, so yes, I have paid for those different platforms and tried them out, and I still found that, and one of the things I do is a lot of my clients are not very techy, so my whole goal when working with tools is to find things that are easy for people to use, that I can easily teach them and they can easily continue on using. Mm -hmm. And they all have templates, correct? So you can yes. create, you can choose a template that works for you and then you can alter that template to match your brand colors. Because of course you want everything to be on brand when you're sending it out. Yeah. And maybe I'll just, I know I talked a little bit at the beginning mostly about websites, but actually what I moved into doing is a lot of the people I work with, like I said, we're not very techy. So I found that a lot of them needed more um, teaching on how to use things like MailChimp, even how to you like it, for some people it wasn't really in budget to have me build their website. So I've now started launching a program I call Tech for Non Techies, where I teach you how to build your own website using WordPress. And as a bonus, you get access to my premium builder Divi, which I also teach you how to use and other tools such as MailChimp Asana for organizing your business, and uh, techniques such as how to use the basics of social media, you know, what the rules are around those, Facebook, Pinterest, Canva, Instagram. So I started to realize they really needed more of that help, and that's where I've now branched off to, is to actually create a teaching program. So if you wanted to book a call with me for 30 minutes, we can talk about what tools would benefit your business, what you've tried, what isn't working, where your frustrations are, and what would, even if they're tools that I don't work with, I can still likely help you find the right tool to help you organize and grow your business. I do have a question. Does MailChimp have a plugin to, um, for Facebook? Because I believe there's a way that on your, if you have a Facebook page, you can have, um, an opt-in to your, um, to your mailing list on there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and you, the thing is, nowadays with the new rules on Facebook, it's gotten a lot harder for people. So that's not as much of a focus for most people. Yeah. You really aren't going to get as much of an organic reach with your Facebook page as you did before. So it's not really a focus that I teach people. We talk about how you can improve your organic reach, uh, but it's having it there is still not a bad thing to at least have the newsletter sign up option there is not, a, not going to hurt you. So you might as well still have it. So I have a question for everyone out there. What do you normally look for in a newsletter? What mm -hmm. makes you open a newsletter and actually read it? Yeah, I've talked about some of mine. So I would actually, that's a really great question for people. I'm interested to know events. Okay. That's good. Useful tips and advice. Okay. Mm -hmm. News from the market. Okay. So you, when you, you mean, uh, sorry, it's Mary Rosie. You mean like you're actually follow when you follow ones that are specific to your industry. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought you meant. Yeah. So instead of us, uh, combing through the news, like, Every morning I go through Google News. That's how I get my news, to be totally honest with you. But sometimes it's nice to have a certain headline that's catered just to me and my industry so that I can go, oh, okay, this is what's going on, or this is something that will be interested, interesting to me and my business. Okay, free tips and events. Can I actually story, have a couple, you at least have a couple people that I know that are doing e-commerce or have products. And things you can actually do too to make your list even more special is special sales just for the people on your newsletter list. Yes. 
not just saying sign up here and get 10% discount, but like saying, Hey, it's my birthday and I would really love to celebrate with you. So here's a coupon just to the people on my newsletter list. Yeah. I've done so, stuff like that in the past. Or what I do is if there are, if I'm opening vendor spaces for any of my events, the people in my newsletters are usually the ones who know probably a week in advance of everyone else. Yeah. So I, I know like, when I've shared personal stories, it's come back. Um, she's left now, but I know in, in the last event in February where I was, we did uh, in Markham, I had totally forgot that I had sent out talking about my dog passing away because I'd written a blog post about my experience um, like what I was facing into the new year and the changes, like how much of a big difference that was. And that someone actually approached me and actually had mentioned that they had, they remembered that my dog had passed away. And I totally forgot for a second how they could know that. And then I remembered, it's not just my blog post, it's because I sent it out to my email list and she was on my email list. Ah. And that's a way that then someone sees you. You shared something with them. And they now have something they can discuss, they can talk to you, they can start connecting with you about. See, that's hard for me, but I'm working on it, guys. I told you, as of May, I'm working on it. <laughs> it's really hard for me to get very personal, but I'm, I'm trying. Baby steps, I'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, Kristen says, something that makes the sender relatable, sharing a story that applies to what they are promoting, their why. Okay, that's good. Rosa says stories of your challenges, being an entrepreneur and growing your business. That's also good. I usually speak candidly about those things too. I'm always the first one to say, if you think being an entrepreneur is easy, stick to the nine to five. <laughs> it's not. Rita here is one of my clients and she actually does say yes, sales, new arrivals. So that is because she's one of the e-commerce people. Uh, um, that's definitely something you share because you're not, you might share some of it on social media, but you're not going to have like a whole bunch of Instagram posts or like massive ones about every single product you've just added right. or, you know, all the new arrivals to your gallery, you know, so putting more of that in your, in your newsletters, the people that are obviously that step up, they're more interested in what you have going on there. True. That is a good place for that. Um, yes, Olga, it's, it's scary. <laughs> Well, and that's where you, you don't have to share everything. So you have your, you sit down and figure out what are you comfortable sharing and what are you not comfortable sharing? One thing for some people is they'll never going to share their children, whether it's on social media, email, whatever. Some mm -hmm. people will never share their children. They feel like that's for their child when they get older to make that choice. Right. Some people, depending on your brand, especially as a woman who's focused on female stuff, may choose never to share their partner if he's, if it's a man. Mm -hmm. Right. So you may, there are people who have female oriented brands who never, you never hear about like a husband or a boyfriend, but they might share their children because that's part of their being female story. I can right? be very honest and say, I know exactly why I don't share things. It's not that I don't share things. If I meet you and we're having a conversation, you can probably ask me anything under the sun because it's not like I'm shy or anything like that. I'll always answer the question. But because I can't, I don't know, I don't know everyone who's on my mailing list. So when I'm sending anything that could be semi-personal, I feel like I am definitely sharing personal information with a complete stranger. And then if I'm, you know, walking up and down the streets and someone comes up to me and goes, oh, hey, Zwania, I remember you sent an email about blah, blah, blah. I know me and I know my face will be like, who are you and why are you talking to me about something that personal? <laughs> so it, it's, it's kind of awkward for me because I know that I'll be put in that situation because even now without sharing personal things, people would have like, you know, seen a YouTube video of me speaking at like a Toronto star event and go, Oh my gosh, I saw you because you did blah, blah, blah. And I'm usually freaked out by that kind of stuff. So <laughs> see, and I'm probably more comfortable as well because I was a dog person for years and people are always wanting to talk. And you talk about, and I think people with kids too, because you, you always get those different kinds of conversations when yeah. you're out there and it's like, you're forced to socialize and people have questions they want to, and you just get used to strange people like approaching you for some reason or another. And so I think it's a different, you, see, you got to get a, do a dog wing, yeah? No, thank you. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> no, thank you. I'm afraid of those. <laughs> 
I'll, I'll, I'll keep bugging you about it. But anyway. <laughs> Not going to happen ever. Yeah. Uh, Rosa, you can relate. Uh, Olga, let's see. Um, your clients like to talk. They will ask many questions if you just give them a chance. It brings the boundaries question to like yeah i am big on boundaries too but if anyone ever asks anything too personal i'm also not afraid to say yeah so that's personal i i don't i don't care if it's personal it's personal i'm not going to share it well and remember that just because you're trying to connect with people doesn't mean you have to be an open book right <laughs> having boundaries is healthy if whether it's business or personal law or other areas of your life having boundaries is a necessity yeah. If you do not have boundaries, you're more likely to wear yourself out. That's true. You're and more then likely you to might get into that too much syndrome where people might feel like they know too much about you. So I guess there is that thin line and we do need to sit down and really um, itemize or just make a schedule of really what, what are your boundaries so that you know what to share and what not to share and then make sure that I know for me in all the emails, I won't say newsletters in general, with all the emails that I send out, my goal is that when you click on an email, you'll know exactly what you're getting. So I will have a totally different brand for webinars so that when you click on an email, you know instantly when you open it that it's going to be webinar details. When you click on an email, you'll know that it's going to be a newsletter. You click on an email, you know that this email is strictly about an events calendar so that you know you get that feel of all the different angles that we have to offer so hopefully starting in may things will look better but i feel like that is really a good tip to try to make sure that there's a way to relate to the audience and to make sure that they're getting value out of what they're getting in their inbox because again yes what am i going to do i have to it's kind of like vying for someone's attention like you're trying to get that perfect date I have to get you to click on my email so that you can read my content because the goal is not just for you to click on it to open it. I want you to read it. And oh, Amanda, you should also tell them about um, what is it that you use to monitor opens? Oh, HubSpot. HubSpot does all marketing, but the free HubSpot CRM, but that only applies to opening when you're sending correspondence through like Gmail or something. So that's one-on-one -on -one correspondence. An email marketing client will mark who opens your emails. So you can see that. But if you're having a one-on-one -on -one correspondence or you're like working on say an event, you want to know who's opened your email and who hasn't. Um, like we do, I actually started doing it for the expos to be honest. No, it's great. <laughs> I wanted to know what sponsors and stuff. For those who don't know, I help with the expos with Duenia. Um, the Toronto one at least. And I actually started it because I wanted to know that the people I was emailing were actually getting the email and opening it even if they weren't responding because i knew we had a, a legit contact that sometimes we won't sure so that's when i connected hubspot crm which i also use to keep track of all of my conversations with people i put and take notes and everything so i can revisit it um and i can see people have opened my email or not so i know if it's legit or not or if i need to maybe look for another contact or find another way to get a hold of them um, and so HubSpot CRM was really, is really good for that. Um, but it's also really good just for keeping track of your client conversations, like not just your emails, but actually keeping track of contact information for your, the people that you're working with and what sort of conversations you're having, making notes of it so that you can always revisit it for future. It's really great for, um, relationship building. Okay. What WordPress version do you teach Amanda orger.com? So I actually, I mean, the .com and the .org aren't different in their base usage. You're just going to have much more ability with the self-hosted version, yeah. which I always get them mixed up. I think it's .org. It's not, so the .org yeah. one is the free platform. So I started with the .org when I did just blogs. And it was great for just blogs, and it got a lot of traction. And then I switched to the .com when... Yeah, I think that's how it is. I might be mixing it up too. But I switched when I realized that I needed more, like, more of a website. <laughs> it's okay to get started with the free version. There's no problem with that. And at least if you're going from the free version to the self-hosted version, um, it's, you, it's still easier to move because it's the same base platform. Right. So there's no problem starting with the free version of WordPress. 
Uh, but I do recommend moving to the self-hosted because there's a lot more capability. You're right. There was but using a builder like Divi or even one of the free ones like Beaver Builder and stuff will still help you for those who are not that techie and worried about it. Divi is amazing. I have to tell you that I remember last year, I think, when you guys did an update to my expo site and one of the one of the pages had Divi and one didn't. And when I went to update the page with Divi, anyone who knows anything about me, when I see something totally different, I freak at first because I'm like, ah, I don't want to deal with this right now. <laughs> and I remember messaging you and Kelly going, what the hell am I going to do? I don't know what to do with this. And it's the easiest thing in the world. Honestly, five minutes and you'll learn it. <laughs> I, my clients, oh, that's why I loved it too. And I can actually, I was the one who asked her if we could get Divi. Um, because I loved it. And now it's the, it's the center of my business when it comes to working with my clients, because it's easy for me to teach them. It's easy for them to continue updating their own website. Mm -hmm. And like I said, my whole goal, because my clients are usually not very techie. My whole goal is what's going to work for them. And you that's know, it's not, if you have to open you, you have to make sure that you know how to do the basics. Right. I can code a whole website with HTML and CSS. I didn't need WordPress. I, WordPress doesn't just help me to do my job faster. It makes it easier for the people that I'm working with. Oh, it's Divi. Uh, are you typing, Amanda? Okay, great. Amanda's going to type what it is for you, Divi. There you go. It's really, really good. Um, other yeah. tips. I'm trying to think of other things. So I know, oh, one important thing is to try to do, try to segment your contacts in mm -hmm. your, um, in your account. So for me, I have a crap ton of segments, but I still think I can do it better. I would have, let's say, segments for my vendors in general, but then I would have breakdowns for guests who attended Ottawa Expos, Toronto Expos, Niagara, Ex or Niagara Seminars, Mississauga Seminars, or events that I've attended. So let's say I've attended like the networking bash with Jennifer Beal. Anytime I go there and I collect information, I make sure I have a different segment for them because what you don't want to do is just select all for everything because the email might not apply to them. Yes, they might know someone who it applies to, but still, <laughs> it might not apply to them. There's a lot I could have included in my presentation, but I really wasn't sure how many questions there would be. And I didn't want us to go for like two hours because I totally could have. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm tired. Okay, people, it can't be two hours tonight. But that is, it's really a good point to try to make sure you're segmenting. And also because a lot of these, I know for Constant Contact, you can do segmented emails where you can send, you know, send the, e send the same email in different segments at different times. And then you can go back and you can see who, what segment responded to the email best in terms of opens and clicks. And you want to monitor your open rate and your click rate, because that's really going to help you determine if you're capturing your audience the way you think you are, right? Yeah, and on MailChimp, you can use tags to be able to send to certain people that are within that group. Yes, so for my webinars, I have a total webinar group, but then they're tagged based on the month and the person who's hosting the webinar. Oh, that's a cat, okay. Ooh. I was gonna say, you got another dog, but I'm also afraid of a cat. <laughs> I was dog-fitting, but she's gone Oh my home. gosh, I got really frightened. And it's not even like here. Um, the other thing, one ultimate goal that a lot of people have when it comes to collecting your email addresses and being able to, is to really be able to capitalize on it. So there could be a lot of joint venture opportunities once you have a certain amount of contacts that are responsive. A lot of people will start, you know, paying you to advertise to your network or offering you percentages of whatever it is that they're trying to sell just for you to send out information to your network. But that comes when you have, you know, five, 6,000 plus people who they might be interested in contacting. And of course, that's one of the main questions I know for us, our sponsors ask, they want to know, you know, what is your reach in terms of your email list, in terms of your social media followers? It's big to them because going through a company like, let's say, Canadian Small Business Woman for a company like Vistaprint is beneficial because when small businesses like us see Vistaprint in our inbox, we're more likely to just scan over it and keep moving. 
But if they see Canadian small business women promoting something that Vistaprint might have to offer, then you're more liable to look at it and be like, oh, okay, really, what's this? So you want to try to build your list so that you can start, you know, using it to your benefit, not just for, you know, you and your goals for your business, but also seeing who you can partner with. Yeah. And I will admit as well, now that we're at the end, that my actual emails, I've, I've not been able to keep up with them. I end up putting all my client work first. So my client's emails are doing pretty good. That's usually how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I say at the beginning. It's like whether it's my website's kind of be like somewhat unfinished. My client sites are doing great. My, you know, and that's generally the way of a service provider is like it. Our clients will be doing fantastic. And that's how we keep getting work. <laughs> So <laughs> but we have to learn to hire the people to do things that we need because it is, it gets hectic when you are the only one trying to do everything. So I don't know. For you and everybody else. Yes. So I don't know if anyone else has any more questions that they, you know, need uh, answer. If you have any comments that you'd like to share, which would be the best sections that a good newsletter should not miss. Well, you need all the important parts that's required by law. <laughs> Let's start with that. Yeah. And yeah, you don't want to reach a $42,000 fine. That's for sure. Yeah. That so, part's yeah. very important. And you also want to make sure that just make sure your brand speaks for itself. Like I will never send an email out that does not say Canadian small business women. Mm -hmm. And also include your social media so people can move from your newsletter to your social media. Yes. Um, you can also give, I mean, you can, so something I tell my other clients is to have a call to action. Yes. And it doesn't, if you're just sharing a story just for connecting, you're not going to have a call to action, but make sure your social media buttons are at the bottom. Or you can, your call to action for a story could be like, you know, asking people to give their opinion on what you've said. Like, you know, mm -hmm. how do you feel about this? Have you ever, ever experienced this before? Yeah, or do you have a good story to share with me? You know, that sort of thing. Um, but generally, I do say give a call to action. You know, you want them to follow through and not more than one. You want it yes. focused. Yeah. There are too many, action, too many options for them to take. They might take none. Okay. They'll be like, I don't know which one. Why? That's what they say. Yeah. I mean, it really can depend on, and that's just generalizing because it will depend on the situation. Uh, if you're doing a bunch of products, maybe have like a new products landing page. So they can just go to one page to see them all instead of like giving them like six different places to click from six different options. Uh, options, like if there's too many choices, they become paralyzed by them. Yeah. So make sure there's one focus for your email that they're going to follow through with. Some people will do like a main focus part of the email, then have their sign off and then have a, like a divider and underneath maybe have links to new blog posts and events for those that do want other things. And that's one way to do it too, but you should have a focus and a goal. When you're sending out an email, you have a goal. Is this one to connect? Is this one to convert? Is this one just for fun? Is it to educate, you know, provide value? So have a goal for your email and that makes it easier knowing what you're asking them to do. Uh, there's a question. Can you legally send out a sign up to my newsletter request to folks you have emails for that you sold items to, or would that be a no, no? So you can do that individually. Mm -hmm. So you would email that person after you can have a follow-up email system. So someone buys from you, then you send a follow-up just saying, Hey, I hope you're enjoying your purchase. I would love to know if you'd like to keep up with my newsletter. You know, and if they do reply back to you and say, yes, you have proof that they've replied, that they have, you can add them to your newsletter, mm -hmm. but you can't do it as a bulk. You can do it one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. Perfect. Well, everyone, it is 8.59 and believe me when I say I have a lot of emails to answer, it's not a joke. Um, <laughs> and I have one more working day tomorrow because I am so tired. You have no idea. But thank you, Amanda, for sharing all this information with us. And I'm very happy that I was able to share some Amanda with you because she's been great to me. So you need to soak up some of the greatness. I will send an email to everyone who signed up for this webinar with not only the link to rewatch the webinar, but also the bit.ly link for you to book a 30 minute session with Amanda so that you can soak up some of her goodness too, like websites, 
amazing. Like she can do a little bit of everything. Come on, really, she can do everything. Um, and she can also tell you about like you know like she loves dogs and cats, and I, I, I'm terrified of them. I think and, I need a face that just says I'm a nerd, <laughs> and then people will know that that's the techie questions. I I might have the answer. She, she's great. She will have the answer. So everyone have a fantastic rest of the night. I think it's supposed to rain. I'm hoping it's just rain and not storm because the last storm that happened around here, I was terrified of that. I also don't like lightning and thunder. I seem like I'm just a walking frightened person, right? But I'm not. I don't know why you're scared of dogs because you're like them. I like them from afar. No, you're like them. Like oh, there's I'm a lot afraid? of scared of dogs. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. I'm terrified. I think they look at me and they go, mmm, dark meat. This whole That's dog thing between Vanya and I is an ongoing. Yeah, it's, it's been ongoing. She's been trying to get me to get a dog. Or even when Bo was alive, it's like, oh, you should come meet Bo. No, thank you. Bo was awesome. That's good for you. But thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic night. Thank you, Amanda. And we will talk. Yeah, have a good night, everybody.